Hello. Um, so uh, here's a screenshot of a, a Facebook profile belonging to a person called Leo Porter. And as you can see, Leo has posted um, a news article on his Facebook page from the Daily Mail talking about um, a best paper at oh, talking about a best paper at a tech conference. Um, and um, this is interesting, or this is notable, because Leo Porter is not real, he's fake. Um, this paper didn't win a Best Paper Award at this tech conference. Um, it's the sound coming in and out. Is that better? Good. Good. Right, I'll start again. Um, so Leo Porter's posted this Facebook article um, talking about this best paper about fake news. Leo Porter is not a real person. Um, this is not a real news article. Um, it's a complete exaggeration of the truth um, delivered via social media. And that's what my talk is about today. It's about falling for fake news, the consumption of news through social media, um, what it means to consume news in the age of, uh, of, of the social network. Um, my name's Martin Flintham. Um, I need to thank my co-authors, Christian Karner, Halid Bashaw, who can't be here because of perennial visa issues, um, Helen Creswick and Stuart Moran. Um, and we're from the Mixed Reality Lab at the University of Nottingham. So <clears throat> I want to kind of introduce my talk by thinking about what it means to consume news in our current era. Um, many people have said that we're living in the post-truth era. So what does that mean? This basically means that um, we're living in a, in a time where objective facts are less influential in uh, shaping public opinion uh, than appeals to emotion uh, or personal belief, right? So this idea that in the era of post-truth or post-fact politics, it's easier to cherry-pick data and come to whatever conclusion you desire. And this is, was the Oxford English Dictionary's word of the year in 2016. Um, and this has implications for um, how we as kind of every, everyday people consume news and how we reason about news kind of delivered to us in various different ways. You might argue that this post-truth era opens the door to for so-called fake news. I mean, this is a word that's been doing the rounds quite a lot in the last year. We wrote this paper about a year ago, and since then, fake news as, as a topic has very rarely left, um, uh, left the, 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 the foreground. Obviously, we have stories like the Cambridge Analytica story of social media being used to kind of sway public opinion through potentially the use of fake news. Um, for the purposes of this talk, we categorised fake news using Victoria Rubin's definition. She said that there were three kinds of fake news, or rather a spectrum of fake news that covers three different things. Everything from humorous fakes, so satire, um, sites like The Onion that you may be familiar with, with news articles such as the aquarium touch tank that lets kids pet water in its natural environment. Um, to large-scale hoaxes as being something different, so that's deliberate deception via, um, kind of uh, instigated by various different actors. Um, top right of this slide is um, uh, a hoax news article about a chemical uh, plant explosion um, in Colombia that was completely fabricated by some nefarious kind of actors out there on the internet. Um, and then finally, uh, she classifies some fake news as serious fabrication, right? So this is the sensationalization or the manipulation of fact to kind of exaggerate the story to make it more, um, more exciting or more controversial, arguably to, to, to drive readers to your news site. Um, and I appreciate many of you won't be from the UK, but in the UK we have a newspaper called the Daily Mail, um, which is, uh, has, a, has a reputation for... Uh, for engaging in this kind of serious fab fabrication. Um, their daily cancer list um, suggests things that may or may not cause cancer. Here is a sensationalized article saying that eggs will cause cancer. Right? So there's another argument that says the Daily Mail causes cancer, but that's a different <laughs> But this is a kind of serious issue, right? So many of you will have seen kind of uh, Donald Trump's engagement uh, or use of the word fake news um, as a pejorative term to kind of try and undermine the validity of traditional hierarchical news agencies like, like CNN. This is the Trump train smashing, um, uh, smashing the, the fake news of CNN that he finds problematic. 
Um, more seriously, we have issues of people, perhaps on the fringes of society, taking fake news very seriously or taking untruths very seriously and then acting upon them. So the Pizzagate conspiracy was, again, quite a famous piece of fake news that led to people kind of believing that the, 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 the government was up to no good and then doing something about it. Um, so why is this problematic? This is problematic because increasingly we as people see social media as a news provider. So we're moving away from traditional forms of, uh, of media consumption to, um, to making use of social media. 66% of UK adults are estimated to use social media on a regular basis, according to our uh, Office for National Statistics. 29% of those say they read or shared news on Facebook in the last week. Um, news organisations have reported a 42% increase year on year in referrals from Facebook to their sites. So basically people are going onto Facebook, they're reading news and they're clicking through um, to read, read the various articles. Those aged between 18 and, nine, uh, sorry, 18 and 29, so the younger age, age groups, say that they consume news via Facebook to a greater extent than more traditional um, methods according to the to, to the Pew report. There's definitely a shift from pe uh, towards people seeing um, social media sites, social media aggregators, Facebook, Twitter, the like, as the way in which they're exposed to media and the, 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 the way that they uh, consume um, news as opposed to directly going to news sites, to television, to, to consume some of that stuff. So what? Why is this important? Um, as you might imagine, news presented through social media is presented incidentally, is presented by friends, but also to subscriptions, or algorithmically presented by, you know, however Facebook determines what you should see. Um, and news of various forms shares the stage with everyday social activities, so the pictures of my cats, what my friends have done on holiday, plus whatever news articles happen to pervade that feed. Um, people kind of consuming news primarily through social, through social media, are said to be uh, less influenced by traditional top-down hierarchical news, news provisions. So they're less bothered about what the BBC, what the Washington Post, what CNN are saying. They're more kind of bothered by what they're seeing on social media. And they tailor their own interest, they tailor their interest in the news towards stories that gain their own personal interest rather than what... Uh, again, those kind of hierarchical institutions tell them they should be interested in. And problematically, teenagers believe that social media is more truthful or more authentic than real news because they feel like it tells, it, it, it tells them like it is. Um, and is it surprising when you see videos in the, in the media, uh, as this you may have seen on social media recently, that really depicts um, uh, kind of traditional news as very hierarchical, very top-down, and not really speaking to individuals. And this, this is, is extremely, extremely dangerous, dangerous to our democracy. democracy. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. And there's a lengthier video of that online if you want. Um, so there's potentially an issue with information literacy where truthiness is more important than facts. Does something feel true? Do I have a gut feeling that it appeals to me? And this is more important than right, the, the opinion of the hierarchical um, news organisations. Um, we also have the confounding factor of the so-called echo chamber, um, and studies have found that high exposure to satire and low exposure to so-called hard news, so traditional news, um, means more credibility is given to some of the satirical or fake um, news examples that I showed earlier. And it also leads to uh, a high level of alienation or a high level of cynicism towards politicians. So an increasing engagement in this gut feeling that it's true news via social media has a problematic effect on uh, other relationships with kind of broader society. Um, there are some remedies to some of this kind of stuff. There's, there's talk about kind of fact-checking services, sites like Snopes, Debunk, or provide fact-checking services where you can go and check your news. And there's also kind of various human-in-the-loop systems, like that one illustrated from Facebook, that can flag up news that is potentially problematic on Facebook. But this, this leads us to our, our research questions in this kind of quite narrow, quite small study where we were interested in um, 
what was it about information presented on social media that might lead someone to believe whether it was real or fake? How might the fast pace of news consumption on social media affect the judgments that were people making on it? And what were common behaviours that people were doing kind of um, when um, interacting with news on social media that might potentially be addressed by kind of future tools, future systems, future approaches? So we did two things. First, we did a survey um, to find out what people thought about the news they were consuming, and then we went on to do a study. Oh, dear, running out of time very quickly. I blame the microphone. Um, the long and the short of this is that um, of our 309 participants, worryingly, 37% had believed they'd come across a story that they initially believed to be true and then later found to be fake. Right? But 46% had come across something that they explicitly identified as, as being um, fake to start with. So here we have the suggestion that people are aware of what fake news is and they're regularly encountering it in their, in their activities on social media. So to probe into this further, we did a task. We made a fake, fake, uh, fake social media feed, that of Leo Porter, that we filled with various news articles of various degrees of fakeness, according to, to Rubin's taxonomy from the start. And we invited participants to examine this fake news, this, this social media feed, um, and to tell us about which articles they thought were fake, which were real, and why. Right? And we prompted them to, um, uh, to ex explain themselves. Um, variety of articles from the absurd to the satirical to the exaggerated to the true um, and we invited people to inspect the social media profile and literally just we left them to their own device about what they wanted to do some were inclined to click through to the article to, 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 to see more detail um, they may do in a minute, and kind of inspect items like the headline. Maybe they could actually read the article if they wanted to. Not many people actually did. Um, and then we subsequently interviewed the, the, the participants about their behaviours. So, number of interesting findings. Um, uh, quite divergent findings here. I'll, I'll very quickly go through these. Um, source as, a, as a, a, a judgment of veracity or truthfulness was important. Either it was the first thing people looked at and they vocalised, I think this is a true article because of the source, or they used it to subsequently question their initial assessment. Oh, I thought that was true, but now I've seen it's New Stump, a satirical website, so I'm not going to trust that anymore. Or maybe they'd, they'd ignore the source completely, perhaps worryingly, again, maybe pointing to this um, lack of engagement with hierarchical news structures. Perhaps obviously they made judgments um, on veracity based on the content, whether it was plausible, whether it was ridiculous, whether it was humorous, or also on the writing style, did it appear to be professional enough? Um, was it funny or not? Um, farmers clearly couldn't have been feeding their cow skittles because that wasn't plausible, even though the article is actually true. Um, interest in this kind of news was very important. Were they interested in it or not? And when there was an article that the, 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 the participant wasn't interested in, um, they ignored it completely. Even when prompted, they were very disinterested in even giving us an opinion about it. So this article about Zoe Saldana, our participant found particularly boring and had to be prompted many times to even give us an opinion about whether it may or may not be true. When asked about solutions to fake, fake news, um, our participants were, um, were, again, a little worried. They were dubious about how useful a tool would be. They were um, uh, untrust, or, or they would not trust it as an, authori uh, an authoritative tool. They maybe wouldn't trust Facebook to do this properly, or they certainly wouldn't, the cr wouldn't trust the crowd to, to label fake news accordingly. So just to conclude some, um, I'll skip through a couple of these. Um, we found conflicting directions for sense-making about fake news from our participants. Um, on the one hand, what interested a reader was particularly important. There were repeated invocations of reported interest, right? And there were certain elements of news consumerism and self-selecting about what was interesting to be consumed and everything else can be ignored. Um, and this has implications for echo chambers, right? Um, even if we can introduce conflicting news into an argument, if the person doesn't find it interesting, they're likely to kind of ignore it anyway. 
Um, on the other side, it's not all bad news. Many of our participants were looking for signs of, of, of reliability, so, so to some extent they're still orientated towards concerns with public debate, right? So there was, they, they felt that there was truth being lost amongst the, the falsehoods, so they were well aware of the idea of fake news and they were well aware that things they were reading might be fake news. Um, so this leads us to questions uh, as to how might we empower users not just with better algorithmic design, which might be the, the kind of the approach of the day, but also through increased media literacy or kind of social media media literacy, whatever that might be, um, augmenting rather than replacing human judgment. Um, so I'll conclude there. Um, some takeaway points here. This is obviously a very limited study, as the reviewers are at pains to point out. Uh, <laughs> not, not, not least in um, sample size, we had a very small sample size in locality, although interestingly our UK participants spoke to the same terms of uh, concepts of fake news as, as you might imagine a US audience would. Um, our scenario is remarkably contrived, but acted as quite a useful prompt to get people to unpack their, pe their perceptions and their behaviours and to draw upon their experiences and use, so that was a good thing. Um, Main conclusions, social media users that are aware of and actively encountering fake news on quite a large scale, uh, as, as can be drawn from our survey, uh, they use various interpretive and argumentative strategies, referring back to the hierarchy, the old hierarchies, but also kind of judgment calls made, um, snap judgments made. Um, and they demonstrate quite clearly that one of the most important factors is how much they're interested in the topic. If they're not interested in the topic of the news, they won't give it a second thought as to whether it's true or false. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, you can tweet me there or ask any questions. There. Hi, Estelle Smith, uh, University of Minnesota. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, I actually have a question about the term fake news itself. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm kind of I'm doing research about what I call misinformation, which is yeah. not quite what you're talking about. Um, but I've heard critique of this term because sometimes, for example, extremely conservative people in America will use the term fake news to describe something that they disagree with, um, and, and that's actually what the term means. It's essentially in practice what it means to them. So when you were talking about what fake news is to your participants, I, I'm curious about how you how you juggled that. Yeah, no, it's a good it's a good question. Um, I think one of the things we did was initially prompt them to find the fake news, um, not necessarily just as a direction, but also to try and unpack what they understood by fake news. Um, and in the paper, we talk about the various things or the various um, uh, elements of the various articles that they pointed to to say this is fake because this is not true or this is fake because I disagree with it. So we weren't prescriptive about what it is, what it, what it was. We deliberately said, you know, use your own interpretation of what you think fake is, hmm. and then point to whatever in the articles kind of aligns with that. So do, do you do them present some type of a definition of like what no. users, no. okay. No. That was just something to think about in the future as you're presenting this, because I think that the term is really loaded and means yes. a lot of different things. Yes. And, and you pointed that out in some of your slides, but yeah. to being precise is helpful. Yeah, yeah it's a so. re really good point. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions? I'll have one of my own as well, if related to that. Is, uh, did you ask your participants about their political backgrounds, because that indeed has like, um, yes. Um, yes. I mean, we. we uh, I mean, in the paper we had we we had nine participants, so very few participants for the um, uh, for the interview study, um, and um, so we do have the d demographic data for those, but not sufficiently to be able to draw useful conclusions from that. Um, they were. Uh, I, I wouldn't like to say. Um, I think mainly liberal, they were kind of, you know, people recruited through word of mouth through our institution, so necessarily I think they were kind of tended on the, uh, on, on the liberal side. I think that's true about our survey results as well. Okay. Thank you. Thanks again.